um, let, let me maybe start. Um, so the plan for today's lecture um, is the following. Um, so first I'll give a quick review of the, of the definition of, of filling area function and then uh, um, we'll basically say the two theorems that uh, restate the two theorems that I'd like to prove um, and then give the aim basically of, of, of what today's lecture is. Um, so I've already mentioned we will need um, some concepts from, from geometric measure theory. These are um, integral currents in metric spaces. Um, and then um, we need rescalings of metric spaces um, passed to a limit. These are called asymptotic cones. And then we'll show um, basically the main property that we'll need in the proof of our theorems. This is um, the persistence of a quadratic isomorphic inequality when you pass when you pass to a cone. Um, so let me maybe uh, just review quickly. So we're giving a metric space X. Um, think of a Riemannian manifold if you if you feel more comfortable, um, and a Lipschitz curve, a closed Lipschitz curve. Uh, for this, we um, defined the filling area as the smallest parameterized Hausdorff area um, of a disk that extends um, our curve. Okay. So then using this filling, filling area uh, with disks, we defined the so-called filling area function, uh, where you basically look at all curves of a given um, length at most r, and um, you try to find the one that is hardest to fill. Okay. In Euclidean space, this would just be plain circles okay, of, of, of radius r. Um, and yeah. Um, so basically, in the rest of my lectures, I would like to prove the following theorem, two theorems, and you know, additional stuff as well, but this is going to be the main aim. Um, first, the following theorem um, that we already stated uh, yesterday. So if you have a geodesic metric space um, and your filling area function for very large r, sufficiently large r, is a bit better than in Euclidean space, then actually it already has to, um, it already has to uh, grow only linearly. Okay, so we said that's a, a Gromov of hyperbolicity condition, or in, in another sense that if you have such a bound, then from far away, every geodesic triangle looks like a tripod. Okay, I would just like to make one comment on this theorem. Um, which actually um, will pre play a role re later. So we said, so that um, this Grom of hyperbolicity that we'll prove, this is a large scale concept, right? So that only depends basically on distances at large scales and not on local geometry, okay? Um, however, this guy here, this filling area function, of course, you know, does also take into account, you know, local stuff, right? If you know, for example, if you have, I mean, the, the, the worst case would be something like, you know, you have a little hole in your space and you're a two-dimensional space. Well, then, you know, your filling function will be infinity, right? So, or if you don't have a hole, but you, you make a lot of little hills here, right? Then you can destroy your function right away just by changing your metric space locally, okay? So this guy here is, is actually also depending on, the, on local data, which, of course, we don't want. Okay. So we will actually prove a much more general theorem, okay, which will get, get rid of this local behavior. So we'll take a different function, okay, which in principle um, can be uh, a, a lot smaller. Okay, and if we can bound this new function, which will only depend on the large-scale geometry, okay, um, and we can bound it by such a thing, then we get the same thing. Okay. So this is not the optimal theorem because you have something that depends on local data, and but you want only wanted to, to, to rely on global data. We'll say that, see that uh, a bit later. Okay. The second theorem um, is the following. So we'll prove that there exists, we'll give a specific example of an ill-potent Lie group uh, for which we can prove that the filling area function is not exactly polynomial. Okay. So for no alpha uh, and uh, a real number, it can grow like this as r goes to infinity. Okay. Um, so, in both proofs, we'll use one, the same basic idea. Okay. So, well, we want a bound 
or we want to, you know, know something about the growth of this function, right, as r goes to infinity. So now, this is rather hard to control when things go to infinity. So what we'll do is, in a given metric space, x, in order to make this, you know, something that is not just large scale, but actually at all scales, we'll rescale the metric, okay? We'll rescale the metric by factor, so that means we shrink, we blow down the metric space, okay? Um, one can make sense, then, of a limit. Or actually, there's going to be many limits, okay? Uh, many possible limits of uh, such a sequence, they're called asymptotic cones. I'm going to explain uh, what, that, what, what that means. Um, and then we'll analyze what we would like to show then. Okay, we would, of course, you know, we still need to bound this guy here somehow or do something with, with this filling function. So what we'd like to do is we would like to show if the original space has a quadratic, at most a quadratic um, filling function on the large scale, then actually in this limit we'll have an honest quadratic isoprometric inequality. So that means for all scales, okay? So intuitively, you think this is quite clear, right? I mean, that's a thing like this should happen because, you know, you, re you, relay you scale rescale curves, so you rescale curves. And, you know, in the end, so if you take a curve in the limit, right, so this should come from bigger and bigger curves that you rescale, okay? Each one of those, you know, for large enough R, has a good filling, so you hope you can pass to a filling in here, okay? So, however, the problem here is that if we define the filling area function via Lipschitz disks, right? Area of Lipschitz disks. So, you would need, if you wanted to, you know, make this trivial, you would need a, a bound on the Lipschitz constant, right? So, you can use some Marcella Scoli type uh, type type thing. And this, I think, is in, 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 in general, you can't expect to have a bound on the Lipschitz uh, constant um, uh, like this, okay, only in very special cases. Um, so what we'll actually need to do, we'll need to um, use a homological version. So the question is, is this true? I don't, this is, in general, will not be true, okay? However, it is true for a homological version. Okay, so that means where instead of using Lipschitz disks, okay, where you would need um, a, a Lipschitz uniform bound on Lipschitz constants, we'll use surfaces. Okay? So, and these surfaces will be integral currents. Okay? Integral currents, we already know, you know, you have good compactness and closure properties, and um, so, so this is much, you know, uh, w w will be actually what, what we want. Okay, okay so... Um, I w my next aim now is to just give a very brief review of this theory of, of, of currents in metric spaces, okay? uh, which is, um, was developed by, by Ambrosio and Kirchheim around uh, 2000. Um, so let me just, I'm not sure whether you're familiar uh, with this theory, so I'll go quite quickly, but I'll try to cover at least the basics. Um, of course, most things absolutely without proof. So let me just um, recall, you've already last week um, with, with Camillo, he introduced uh, integral currents and currents in Euclidean space. So what are these? So in Euclidean space, the feed of the Fleming current, right, it's just a continuous linear functional on smooth, compactly supported M forms, okay? So now the first question is, of course, in this theory, so if we want to do a thing like that in, com uh, in, in, in metric spaces, you know, what is a good substitute of an M-form? Okay, so because you don't, can't really make sense of that. So, idea of the Georgi in around 95 in a small paper, he outlined this, that maybe one can use M plus one tuples of Lipschitz functions on your metric space as a substitute for M-forms. So, of course, you'll ask yourself right away, well, you know, what, at least in Euclidean space, should such a tuple, what kind of smooth n-form or m-form should this um, uh, represent? Well, as we will see, um, if x is a Euclidean space, then you should think that 
such a tuple should represent f times now that's the exterior derivative, right? So that's a, just a one form, so the wedge product of, of, of one forms here, okay? So um, this we'll just use a, a, as an idea first, okay? And just because, remember how, for example, so if T is a current in Euclidean space, you know, how did we define the boundary or how did Federer Fleming define the boundary? Just by duality with the exterior derivative, right? So if you take an m to the boundary of t of an m minus 1 form now, this is just t, the exterior derivative of this. Okay? So now, if you look at this correspondence, right? so if you take the exterior derivative of this form here, right? what you get is df wedge d pi 1 and so on. Right? Okay? So now, this will actually you know, give in some sense, an indication on how, on how one should um, define the boundary. Okay? So our um, metric currents, they will be just linear functionals on such tuples. Okay? And in the Euclidean case, we had that this should be uh, continuous, right? So we'll have a continu uh, continuity property. Okay? So then the second thing is, well, how do you, for a Lipschitz map or a smooth map, how do you define in Euclidean space, how do you find um, the push forward via a Lipschitz or, a, a, say, a smooth map, right? You just basically pull back, again, by duality, you pull back um, your differential form, okay? So now, if you pull back such a differential form by a smooth map, well, then you simply compu uh, compute that you get this formula, so that gives us an indication, will give us an indication again how to define the push forward of a metric current. Okay. So everything I'm gonna say now will, you know, is um, was developed by Ambrosio and Kirchheim in, in, in their um, breakthrough theory on, on metric currents. And so whenever you see definition or theorem or proposition, this will always be due to Ambrosio Kirchheim in their 2000 Octa paper. So, um, okay, we start with a complete metric space. And now, as I already said, the, um, the, the, the space of, of, of M forms, okay, should be Lips, tuples of Lipschitz functions, okay? So here I use the notation, Lip X is the space of all Lipschitz functions. So here, that should be the M-fold product of Lipschitz functions. And the first F, the first argument there should actually be a bounded Lipschitz function. Okay? So in Euclidean space, remember, there you take smooth, compactly supported forms, right? Okay? Well, if you're in a, for example, in the infinite dimensional Banach space, of course it doesn't make sense you know, to, 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 to have the first argument f, for example, um, that this just will be compactly supported, right? That doesn't make any sense because it would just have to be zero. Um, so instead of taking compactly supported, you take just bounded Lipschitz functions. Okay. We'll also actually need uh, two more spaces, uh, one more space. This is the, um, the space of bounded Borel functions on X. Okay. And in the following, I will um, denote by lip F the Lipschitz constant um, of a map from one metric space to another. Okay. Please. Um, Slow me down if you have questions or, um, yeah. Okay, so now, Ambrosio and Kirchheim, they find currents as following, as follows. So this is a function on these test forms, on these tuples, which is, well, okay, they should be, in Euclidean space, it's a linear function, right? So they should be linear in each component. So it should be linear so it is a function on such tuples and it should just be linear in each component. Okay. Then in Euclidean space you have a continuity so they assume a continuity um, property as well. Okay. So which just says the following if you have a sequence of such forms, Lipschitz forms, okay, 
such that the pi um, on the first one, you, 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 for the moment, you just uh, fix, okay? Um, and then you have a sequence of those with Lipschitz constants bounded, and if they converge pointwise, if each pi i um, n converges pointwise to pi i, then you want to have convergence. Okay. So maybe I should say right away, so what in, in Euclidean theory, right, so you have basically um, continuity. There you want sequences, right, where the derivatives also converge. Okay. And here, so this continuity property is, or continuity axiom is much stronger. Okay. So you want, even if the derivatives, right, they're just bounded functions, okay, as long as you have pointwise convergence, uh, you want already that, uh, your, your, um, that, that, um, that it converges. Okay. So this is a stronger, um, a stronger um, kind of continuity, and this already gives an indication why, you know, if X is Euclidean space, you know, this is not going to be the same space as the Fedor Fleming currents of finite mass. So, um, okay, now, so we said that the pi i's, or the f pi i's, they should represent, in the Euclidean theory, such a form here, right? So now, of course, if the pi i here is constant, right, then this m form here is just the zero form, okay, it's just zero, okay? So now, a priori, Right now, so if this is just a linear functional, a continuous linear functional, well, you know, why should it depend on, in some sense, a derivative, the change of pi i rather than pi i themselves? Okay, so that's the next, um, that's the next uh, axiom. So um, if the pi i, if one of the pi i is uh, constant on the support of f, then you would like your t to be um, zero. Okay, so that, in some sense, just means that the t should, in some sense, depend on d pi i rather than pi i, the values of pi i itself. Okay. And uh, lastly, unlike in the Euclidean theory, you know, here um, we, we uh, impose a finite uh, mass condition right away. So uh, we require that there exists a finite Borel measure, mu, which is concentrated on a sigma compact set, so that means on the countable union of compact sets, such that we can bound T of F pi i's um, by the product of the Lipschitz constant times this integral for every um, Lipschitz, um, Lipschitz form. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, for those who want to copy down, I'll just uh, leave it quickly. Mm. So, okay, the, the, the space of n currents of finite mass, now it's just, you know, the space of all, all, all these currents, right? Okay, um, so we denote it by, as in Euclidean space, but be aware if x is equal to Rn, this is not the Federer Fleming uh, metric current space of finite mass. Okay. Um, okay, one remark. Um, this is not difficult to see. The first part that whenever you have a metric current, then it extends uniquely to um, a functional, which I will denote again by t, where the first argument is just a bounded Borel function. Okay. So this simply follows from the fact that uh, the Lipschitz, the bounded Lipschitz functions, if you fix you know, such a measure mu, okay, um, as, you know, as before, that basically bounds you know, uh, t, um, this is the space of bounded Lipschitz function is dense in the space L1 x mu, okay? So this is dense. So then one can show that this new functional now, that this satisfies all the four properties when f is not 
Lipschitz bounded, but actually only Borel unbounded. Okay, so the first and um, so the, the multilinearity is, is, is clear. This is a direct uh, consequence, basically, of the approximation. Okay, then um, the continuity. This is also easy. There you need this bounded mass property. The bounded mass property four is also clear. It's also not difficult to prove. The only um, the only um, problematic thing is the locality. So if pi i is constant, so beforehand we had pi i constant on the support of f, right? When f is Lipschitz unbounded, then that this is zero, right? Okay. So now this is not uh, completely clear, right? If I here have just a Borel function, okay, then t of f, and I will usually abbreviate just pi to say pi 1 through pi n. Um, so this is just, you know, approximated by here, you basically have to choose Lipschitz functions, okay? So then once you approximate this, while well, the pi i might not be constant on, so this is t f, say, n pi, okay, where this is Lipschitz and bounded. So now, you know, this is not going to be constant anymore. The pi i is not going to be constant on the support of this anymore. Okay. So in order to prove that this um, locality property still holds, um, you need all the axioms. You need continuity, uh, you need locality, and you need finite mass. Okay. So um, I think just, do we have, yeah, I think just to, um, um, to give you an idea how one uses these things to play around a little bit with the um, with these axioms to get a bit of a a grip on it, um, I'll present the argument. Huh? Okay, so uh, let's maybe go back to so that we have all the definitions ready. Okay, so what I would like to prove is that this locality property here also holds when I approximate and f is just a, a bounded Borel function. Okay, so I'll do actually an easier case. So first of all, you know, I can always, when I look at f and pi 1 until pi m, I can always just, you know, fix all the other pi's except the, the i-th one, okay? And then basically I can assume that I actually have a, just a current where I have one of the one pi here, okay? So which then means that it's just a one current, okay? So I will actually just do the argument. Um, in a bit the special case, okay? So I will assume that it's a one current by just fixing all the other pi i's, and I will assume you know, that my f, which is bound the barrel, that this is just indicator function, a characteristic function on a Borel set, okay? So suppose this is a, a Borel set, and that the pi, okay, we only have one pi now, that this is constant on B, okay? So, of course, you know, by just subtracting um, this constant, I can, of course, assume that this is zero on B, okay? So now what I would like to show is that If I take the indicator function on B and plug in the pi, that this is zero, okay? So from this case, you get very easily then, you know, to just via the, uh, the, the, the finite mass property, you get to the case when F, when this indicator function is replaced by Borel functions, okay? So we'll um, prove this by contradiction. So we suppose that um, this is not zero, okay? So suppose that this is, say, two, is two epsilon, which is bigger than zero in absolute value, okay? So now I can choose, so fix, maybe fix a mu, just a measure that satisfies this, okay? Fix mu, and so now, 
I can, first what we're going to do, we want to approximate this by um, Lipschitz functions, right? Okay. But the problem is if we approximate this by Lipschitz function, this is not being a constant. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're also going to approximate this by another Lipschitz functions that are basically constant on the approximation here. Okay, so that's, that's the main idea. How do you do that? Well, first, um, we can find a closed set. You'll see why we, we want the closed set. So closed, so simply because mu is a finite Borel measure, we get the closed set with mu of, so a subset of B that, um, such that the complement is strictly smaller than epsilon. So now, it follows, of course, that, um, so claim, we have that T, now if we replace uh, B by C, then this is strictly bigger than, than this, okay? So this basically just fo uh, follows from applying uh, the finite mass condition and using, using this. Oh, maybe I should also say, you know, we can assume without loss of generality, we can, of course, assume that the Lipschitz constant of pi is smaller or equal to 1, okay, just by multiplying your function by, by uh, the inverse of the Lipschitz constant, okay? So now we define, suppose, so this, I think, is okay, okay? And now we start approximating, and we'll see why closed uh, is a, um, why we want the closed, so for delta, we define now first a G delta, which approximates this guy here, basically, or actually we just have to approximate this guy. So this is the following um, Lipschitz function. So this is on X. So I'll just basically draw the graph. So this is my closed set C. Okay, I draw the delta neighborhood, so this is the delta neighborhood which I um, denote by C delta, which is basically all the x in your space such that the distance to C is smaller or equal to delta. Okay, So that's my C delta. And now I just take the indicator function on C and then by the distance function divided by um, 2 over delta or something like that, you let it go down very quickly. Say this is maybe smaller or equal to delta, or this is exactly delta half. Okay? So this we can do just using the, the, the delta function, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the distance function. Okay, so that gives us a, a Lipschitz function. So um, we also, so now this is going to approximate basically our um, indicator function here. Okay. And now we also want to approximate the pi's because we want them basically to be, you know, constant on the support of one of those guys. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, that's a simple trick. So for delta, again, we now define first a function from R to R which is basically just the following function. So here we have zero, here we have delta. So we just make it around zero in the little neighborhood, delta neighborhood, we make it uh, zero. And then otherwise it's basically like the, uh, we have slope one here and going slope down here. So then, so that's of course one Lipschitz. So that's the slope one, right? Okay, so now if we set pi, say delta, to be rho delta composed with pi, then this is zero in a delta neighborhood of, so this is, this is equal to zero on the delta neighborhood of C. Okay, so now, you know, um, so this guy here is zero on, um, outside the delta neighborhood. So what we get is that, um, what we get is that, what we clearly get 
is that if I take T and I take G delta um, and pi delta, okay, then this is zero for every delta. So now, um, we're almost done. So now, just note the following uh, uh, few things. So, note, firstly, um, that T G delta, oops, okay, T G delta, uh, and pi, okay, by um, basically the finite mass property, okay, this goes to T uh, 1C and pi, okay, so that just follows from 4, okay, simply because, um, well, you know, the integral of G delta minus 1C, okay, so this is D mu, it's just smaller or equal to mu, so this guy has support in, uh, in, in, in C delta, so this is just C delta over, uh, yes, C delta minus C, okay, and that goes to zero, right, because the, 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 count, uh, the, 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 the countable uh, intersection of C delta, so C delta goes to zero, is just C, okay, and then, um, so that means there exists a delta, say, a delta zero, um, bigger than zero, such that, so this guy here is bigger than, bigger than uh, um, epsilon, um, so that we have T G delta zero, pi is bigger than epsilon, and also we can of course, just because that goes to zero, we can also assume that at the same time this goes, this is smaller than epsilon, okay? So now, second thing we know, so now we've used this thing, and um, now we just uh, use the continuity, okay? So we have that um, G, um, let me see, what do I want? Yes, so now I use the G delta zero down here, okay, so that's a fixed function now. And if I take now pi delta, and I let, so that's delta going to zero, of course, and I let delta go to zero, then this converts us to T, G delta zero, and pi, okay? So that's just the continuity axiom here, okay? And uh, because this guy here, um, uh, sorry, this guy here is, 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 is one Lipschitz, right? So this is always the same Lipschitz constant, okay? Okay, so that means we find a delta which is maybe smaller than, uh, which is smaller than delta, delta zero, okay? So that, this is again, you know, um, that this guy here is very, is, is, is bigger than epsilon, okay? So um, that means we get that there exists a delta one in zero delta zero, such that T of G delta zero uh, pi delta one is bigger than epsilon simply because this guy here is bigger than epsilon in, in absolute value, okay? So now uh, we're basically done uh, because now we just have, we can put all these th things together. So we have epsilon is smaller than um, the, the absolute value of, um, of G delta zero and um, pi delta one. Mm -hmm. That's this one, okay? So, but this guy here, because it's always the zero for if, if the, the deltas are the same, so we get here that this is T G delta zero minus G delta one pi delta one. Okay. That's just because if you take just these two guys, right, then it's zero, okay? And so this now by the finite mass property, just gives you small than g delta zero minus g delta one, okay? And um, so this guy here, they have support in, um, they have support in, in, 
in the neighborhood of, of so this is smaller or equal to, um, this is smaller or equal to mu of C delta zero C C, which is smaller than epsilon, and that gives you contradiction. Okay. So that um, shows that actually this also holds for the uh, for the uh, for F um, just in behind the plural. Okay. Okay. So so this is a strengthening of the of the um, of the of the locality property. So now a proposition, so now we just had fixed in mu, right? Um, but now, of course, you'd like, in some sense, to define the mass. And um, the mass should basically be the smallest mu that you can, you can find. Okay? Uh, that still holds, you know, that still satisfies this property. Okay? So there exists actually a smallest plural measure that satisfies this and will denote it by by, by the measure of t, okay, or the mass of t. And this you can um, um, show, one can show that this is given by the following formula. So basically the supremum of now um, the sum of t f n's and pi n. So here I abbreviated pi 1 n until pi m n just by pi n. Okay, so I will do that very often. From now on I just have pi will actually represent pi 1 through pi m. Okay. So this should, um, this should um, remind you, of course, this formula down here should remind you um, of the, again, of the Euclidean thing, where basically the measure of t of u was something like the supremum okay, of t omega, where omega is um, bounded smooth form, small or equal to one, okay, and the support of omega is in U, okay. So this is basically an analog, an analog of that, okay. Um, okay. So now you can define the mass of the total mass, like the mass of the on the whole space of T, just as the measure of T on the whole. Of x, okay, and an immediate corollary now of the proposition that we had is that this mass is lower semi-continuous, okay, simply because beforehand it was given by a supremum of you know basically plugging in test functions, right? So then this clearly passes to the limit, um, and there you get a lower semi-continuity. Okay. So just a quick remark: we'll we'll we'll, we'll use that uh, a bit later, you can check easily that, um, that the space of m currents becomes a complete metric space when you take the metric, the mass metric. Okay. So now we can uh, make some constructions. Okay, so we can define um, the, 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 the boundary of a t when m is bigger or equal to 1. And as you see, is exactly, you know, um, using this intuition that a f pi 1 through pi m should correspond to f d pi 1 wedge d pi m, okay? So then the exterior derivative where you, that you want, if you take it here, right, we said that this is df wedge d pi 1. So this should correspond by the George's idea to, this is 1 times this, so 1 f pi 1 and so on. Okay? And you define it exactly like this. Okay? So now it follows immediately that the boundary satisfies the first three property. So multilinearity is of course clear. Continuity um, is also clear, right? Because you basically, you, there you just take functions here. So it's continuous. T is continuous. So if you take this and they converge, right, then you get exactly what you want. Okay? 
So the only thing that you still have to think maybe a little bit is the locality axiom. Right? So the locality axiom, that would now suddenly mean that pi, a certain pi i, is constant on the support of f, right? But now the support of f, if you plug this tuple here into, oh, that should actually be now m minus 1, right? Okay. If you plug this in, right, then this is constant on this guy here, okay? But now, using just, so this, you can, of course, also write as t, because we have this extension, this unique extension, right? You can write this as, we can just take, write 1 as indicator function of support plus the uh, support comp complement, okay, plus T and now this on the X minus the support, F and pi 1 and so on. So now because we had this extension, right, we said we proved that this extension uh, satisfies again the, the locality axiom for, you know, uh, for just Borel bounded functions. Okay, so now this guy here, the pi, one of the pi i, say pi 1, okay, is constant on the support of f, so it's actually constant on the support of this guy here. Okay, so this then becomes 0, okay, and f is constant, of course, on the support of this guy here, so this becomes also 0, and you're done. Okay, so, so that gives, gives you uh, uh, this. Okay. And of course, you know, it's clear that if you take twice the boundary, then this gives you zero, simply because you have then t1, 1, 1, f, and so on. But this guy here is constant on the support of this, and you know the, the locality axiom gives you right away that this is your zero. Um, okay, so now for ellipsis map from our complete metric space x into another complete metric space y, you can define simply by this. And if you remember the formula that we had before for the pullback, for the pullback of by ellipsis map of this guy here. So this we already said this is just composition here, composition here, um, and so on. Okay. So and then. This should correspond just, you know, clearly to the tuple F composition with phi, and then you compose everything. And so this is exactly, you know, corresponds to this. So in some sense, this intuition, what one should have, you know, has been confirmed so far, right? Okay. So, and here it's trivial to check that um, push forward of a, a current of finite mass is again the current now in the in the target space, and you have um, this um, inequality for the um, for the mass of the push forward. Okay, so this is uh, straightforward. Okay. Also, just because we def we extended t to bound the Borel functions in the first argument, okay. Now you get you can of course define the restriction just by adding here in the indicator function on a Borel set uh, A. Okay? And then, you know, by what we showed, um, this is clearly then uh, a metric current. Okay? And you can easily check that the mass of the restriction is the restriction of the mass. Okay? So I should say one more thing about this correspondence here. And since I'll make it very brief, because otherwise I will not have time to give you any of the applications uh, to this filling area problem. Um, I, I won't note it down here, but just here, what do you have? So in Euclidean theory, right, of course, f d pi 1 wedge d pi 2. So this is f d minus f d pi 2 d pi 1. So if you switch those, then, you know, the, the, the m form becomes the negative, right? Okay. 
So in our in the def definition of a current, you know, this was not an axiom, right? This was not a condition that you actually should have an alternating property. However, you can actually prove this. Okay. So they uh, Ambrosio Kirchheim they proved that if you switch any i's and j's, pi i's and pi j's, let's maybe do it for the first, okay, that this is negative t f and now pi 2 and pi 1 and then leaving the rest um, fixed, okay. So that you have actually the same thing and of course you can also ask yourself, so when I do, when I multiply here by a function, right? So the exterior derivative, that would just by the, by the product rule, you would get tau times the exterior derivative plus you know, pi m times the derivative of this, okay? So you should say, okay, well, you know, you should have a correspondence there again, and again, this is true, actually. You can prove this, okay? So that's actually quite surprising. I think that this, you know, this is such a, a, such a nice correspondence um, that this actually all is true. So I will not note it down here, but um, the correspondence goes further than what I state here. So we haven't given a single um, example yet. Um, so let's give um, the first basic example. So if, for any L1 function, so the following integral, so pi again, you should think as pi 1 through pi m. Okay? So then we know by Rademacher theorem, the derivative you know, the pi is, is, is differentiable almost everywhere, and, you know, the differential is, of course, uh, bound to borrow, so we can take the determinant, and we take this integral, okay? So that defines a current in the sense of ambrosia Kirchheim. okay? Um, so what is not, you know, the continuity axiom, right, this is the only thing that is, 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 not, is, is not evident, right? So multilinearity is clear, just by multilinearity of the determinant, um, then um, then, um, um, then locality is also clear. If one of the pi i's is constant, then you know the, um, the, the determinant is zero. The finite mass property is also clear. Uh, the only thing that is, 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 is uh, not uh, straightforward is the continuity. Okay. But this actually follows from, from, from the weak continuity of determinants. Okay, so that you can check that this is this is actually also true. Okay. Um, so now, normal currents in the Euclidean theory, they were defined as those currents whose boundary mass is finite, okay? We already said that if you take a current, well, m should be uh, bigger or equal to one, right? We can make sense of this boundary. We said it um, satisfies all the axioms except maybe the, um, the finite mass axiom. So if that finite axiom, uh, axiom is also satisfied, then um, you call it a normal current, okay? And actually, normal currents in, in uh, ambrosio kirchheim theory in Rn is actually the same as Federer-Fleming um, normal currents. Um, so there you have a one-to-one, -one, you have an isomorphism between the two, okay? So, Now the first important theorem that we will, we will use, we'll need to use, is that if X is a compact metric space and you have a bounded sequence of normal currents, so bounded in the sense that um, mass and boundary mass are, are, are bounded, then you have a subsequence that converges to um, some limit current, which is again a normal current, okay? So remember, um, uh, yeah, okay. So, of course, one has the same uh, thing. Um, so, in, in Euclidean um, case, you just have um, you just have that they are continuous linear functions, so they're elements of the dual space, and there you have uh, you have weak star compactness, right? By Banachaloglu, you get you get something. So here you have to work a bit because you don't just have a uh, a, uh, uh, a dual space here. Okay. Okay. Now. The object that we really want is actually not normal currents, but integer rectifiable currents. Okay? So for um, zero dimensional, 
So we will split the definition in two. Uh, in two. First, for zero dimensional, these are just sums of pointer evaluations. So here, for a point in our metric space X, we'll use this to denote the zero current. So a zero current, remember, so we have to, the, the test forms, I said, I should maybe have emphasized that, this is this cross lip to the M, okay? So when M is zero, actually I will just, this means that there's nothing here. So this is just a functional on, on, on bounded Lipschitz functions, and this is just evaluation. Okay? So really what you can think of uh, integer rectifiable current, and the integer means just that you have an integer, integer uh, multiplicities here. So this is just a finite set of points with multiplicities. Okay. Now, remember what is an integer rectifiable current of higher dimension in, in, in Rn, right? So basically, this is you integrate, and now here you integrate on um, an countably rectifiable, countably m rectifiable set. Okay, so basically this is a um, union, countable union of bi Lipschitz pieces or Lipschitz pieces or you know, even C1 manifolds or parts of pieces of C1 manifolds. Okay, and you know you have a multiplicity function, and then you integrate. This, you also have, of course, there you have a, um, um, you know, at almost every point, you have a tangent, so you have an orientation. So it's given like this, okay? So we're here. This is the union of Lipschitz pieces or bi Lipschitz pieces of certain sets, okay? Countable. Um, so now the definition here, at first sight looks different, okay? So a finite mass current of dimension bigger or equal to one is called integer rectifiable. First, if its uh, measure is concentrated on a countably HM rectifiable set. So this, by this I mean, you know, it's a, it's a Borel measurable and it's the countable union of Lipschitz pieces of Lipschitz images of, 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 of subsets of, of Rm, okay? And it vanishes on negligible Borel sets, okay? So, so far, so good, right? It, it lives on a rectifiable set, on a countably HM rectifiable set, okay? Now, what is integer so far? You know, there's no integer rectifiable, right? The integer, so we have to make sense of this somehow. So, and this is done as follows. Whenever you have from, so here is your, uh, rectifiable set, right? So whenever you take a Lipschitz map down into your RM, okay, then it should look like one of the guys that we saw, okay? Basically just integration and uh, integration of that, okay? So uh, plus a integer, clear, clearly an integer uh, multiplicity, okay? So actually one can prove that this is just the same definition as this, okay? Namely, uh, that's the following thing. So first, let's maybe denote the space of integer rectifiable m currents, um, like with a curly m x as, as usual, okay? Um, so then one has this following represent, uh, representation theorem. So if you have an integer rectifiable current, okay, then there exists by Lipschitz pieces, so I basically, so I have by Lipschitz pieces here, so that makes out a countably HM rectifiable set, and on each one you basically just have integration of an integer multiplicity uh, uh, function, okay? Um, so, uh, yeah, and so you can represent it like this, and you know the mass, you don't have any cancellation, that means that the mass is exactly this, okay? So then this is very close to this. You know, if this is a countable union, you could just as well write this, of course, as this, where you have the phi, the, the ki, you push it forward with the f and with the phi, right? So you have maybe a guy like this, and then, you know, you, you basically have to just take the push forward there, 
Okay, so that's very close to 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 to, to this guy here. Um, okay. Okay, now integral currents. These are integer rectifiable currents whose boundaries um, um, have finite mass. Okay, sometimes actually, you know, in the Euclidean theory, people um, define it as those whose boundary is 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 again a rectifiable integer rectifiable current, right? Okay, but actually, one can prove that this is the same. This is the uh, celebrated boundary rectifiability theorem, okay, which also holds in this setting. Okay, very, I mean, very now not surprisingly anymore, but I mean, I think that was a big surprise that 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 you would have all these uh, um, the key properties of the Feder Fleming theory you also have here. Okay, and now the closure theorem, which I think you already saw in in the Euclidean case, um, is also true um, in 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 the in arbitrary complete metric spaces. Okay, so if you have the weak limit, oh, I forgot to say it last time. So um, in the in, in this um, lower semi-continuity, right? So this is uh, you take pointwise limits, right? If you take um, so we had lower semi-continuity, so weak convergence here just means Pointwise convergence, that means whenever you fix Lipschitz forms, okay, then you want to have that this converges to the limit. Okay. And the closure theorem says that if a sequence which is bound in the descent converges pointwise to a normal current, okay, then um, this limit is actually a um, uh, again an integral current. So this is um, this is um, yes okay. So you see that all the key features of the Euclidean theory are actually hold in a complete generality of of, of, of complete metric spaces. Okay. So uh, that was the I think so yes that is the very brief um, um, very brief review introduction um, without uh, any proofs. Of, of this theory, which now we will use uh, in order to, to um, attack our problem, namely, you know, to prove these two theorems. And the first step will, will be um, to say, okay, if we have um, a filling area function that is quadratic in the space, then the more generalized um, filling area function where you use currents rather than uh, Lipschitz disks, you know, is actually also quadratic in any limit um, of free scalings. Okay. I think maybe it's a good uh, um, time to, to make a break uh, here. And in 10 minutes, we'll start defining these limits of rescalings of metric spaces. OK, I think I'll, uh, I'll continue. Um, so yeah, this is, of course, a very, was only a very, very brief. And we'll, as you see, we'll use it basically as a black box almost, because I didn't. Uh, and proof, proof, proof anything. Um, so now we will look at rescalings of metric spaces. Okay. So we said that we take a metric space, we take a sequence of rescaling factors. We want to shrink the metric space, so we take our ends going to zero, um, and we look at this at this thing. Okay. So before you know taking a thing like that, what we will do, we'll just look at sequences of metric spaces, okay? Just take this dn and, you know, we'll just look at sequences right away, okay? So we would like to make, um, we would like to make um, sense of limits of sequences of metric spaces, okay? So um, there is a notion of so-called gromov hausdorff convergence. Uh, however, you know, so there you need, maybe you know it, maybe you not, um, there, one needs, you know, that basically all the spaces um, are uniformly on every scale. They're uniformly about the same. Okay, they have. That means that you know, each ball can be covered by uniform number of epsilon balls. Okay, and then you can expect convergence. Okay, um, so, but however, you know, this is in general. Of course, you don't have. For example, if you just take, you know. So you glue to a copy of R, 
say you just glue hairs on at each integer point. So these are copies of the interval zero infinity, right? So now if I start to rescale the metric, for example, so, you know, by a factor of, of, of one half, well, then this guy he'll remove here. So then you have suddenly, you know, at each point here, you have something, okay? Then you do that, you know, smaller and smaller, and you'll see that you have more and more hair, hairs growing out here, okay? And, you know, clearly there will not be a gromov hausdorff um, a chrome of Hausdorff limit, okay? So, so in general, what we want and, you know, uh, the spaces that we, we, we care about right now, you know, you can't expect in general this, okay? So now, nevertheless, one can define a limit, a certain kind of limit um, of arbitrary sequences of metric spaces. How is that done? So we start with a sequence of metric spaces, xn and dn, and Basically, a little bit like um, when, you know, doing the construction for the completion of a metric space. You know, so an element of the limit should basically just be a sequence of elements in Xn, okay? So you would like that, in some sense, a point in the limit space should just be an equivalence class of uh, Xn's where each xn is in an xn, okay? So we will need uh, base points, we'll see why, and we define now um, x hat as all the sequences where each xn is in a space xn, and we would like that they're all a bounded distance from our base point. So you have like a point of observation, Pn in each space. And then you just take points, sequence of points. Okay. So now, how would we like to, how would we take uh, the, the distance? Okay. So of course, if they're all the same copies, right, and all the points are the same, well, then you basically want that the, uh, the, the distance of the limit points should just be you know, the distance of the points or the limit of the distance, okay? So since we have that, um, since we have that the, uh, all xn's are a bounded distance from, from, from the base points, right? So actually this sequence here is ba a bounded sequence, right? Okay, so that means this bounded sequence has at least a subsequence, bounded sequence of distances, has a subsequence that converges. Okay. So now the problem is, of course, you know, how, which subsequence should I take? Okay. In general, well, it's, it's pretty difficult if your space is big you know, to actually, in a consistent way, to always two subsequences. It's just not possible. Okay. So um, if you have proper uh, spaces, then you know, then separable spaces that. Uh, that, that, that works, but, but, but in general, not, okay? Um, <coughs> proper spaces, sorry, not separable ones, okay? But however, there is a device which makes a consistent choice of convergent subsequences in some sense, okay? However, for this, you, we will actually need Zorn's lemma, okay? So this device is called a non-principal ultrafilter, okay? Which in some sense, it extracts uh, convergent subsequences of guys like this, you know, for any uh, bounded sequence. Okay, what is a non-principal uh, non, 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 uh, ultrafilter? So, this is a finitely additive measure on on n. Okay, so on all the function from all subsets of n, which has only values in zero and one. Okay, so basically it says which subsets have full measure and which, you know, have a zero measure, okay? So which ones you disregard and which ones you still consider, okay? Furthermore, you'd like that it's a probability measure in the sense, you know, that, so you only have finitely additive, huh? not uh, because otherwise, you know, um, and you would like that finite sets that they all have zero measures, okay? So, of course, you can't expect you know, that it's a um, 
sigma additive measure, right? Because otherwise, you know, the whole n would have to have measure zero, right? Um, so that's, so you have finitely, uh, only finitely additive you can expect at the most, okay? And one can prove that such a thing exists, okay? And now we said that we would like to extract for given sequences xn, xn prime, right? we would like to choose a sub subsequence of this. So this is a bounded guy, okay? And actually, our non-principal ultrafilter does exactly this, okay? So why is that? There is an easy proposition that you uh, can... Uh, No, you don't have that. Uh, okay. So it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that, you know. So, for example, if you take all the odds or all the, the, the evens, right? So, I mean, one of them will have zero and the other one have, has, has one, okay? So that basically means that the, the subsequences that you choose in some sense, you know, are going to be the ones in the, in the even ones, okay? Okay, so now, you know, every sequence actually of real numbers of bounded, you know, every bounded se uh, sequence um, of real numbers, you know, you can associate a so-called ultra limit, okay? Actually, this is much, uh, this is, this is um, um, true much more generally, namely whenever you have a compact Hausdorff topological space, so not necessarily with, with a metric, we will only use metrics, um, and a sequence in there. So, for example, here we would just have the a bounded interval in R. Um, so, then there exists a unique guy such that whenever you take a neighborhood of um, this point, you know, all the indices end such that xn is in here, this has um, measure 1, okay? So this guy here is, of course, unique. This is, this is very easy uh, to show because, as we already said, you can't have two sets, right, that are disjoint, that, um, yeah. And um, so, the, so this is easy uh, to show that, that you have such a thing. And so that means now that we can always, so let me maybe say, we will just note the limit, the ultra limit, okay, the z, we'll call it the ultra limit, and we'll just um, um, denote it by lim omega of zn, okay? So that means here, for any bounded, so that because that's a bounded sequence now, right, we will get such an ultra limit, okay? So, and it's not hard to show, of course, right, because here, all the ends in a neighborhood that satisfy this, this has to be an infinite set, right? And you can make, at least now if you're in a metric space or in R, you know, you make this neighborhoods U, which are just epsilon intervals, make smaller and smaller and smaller, and you easily see that there exists a subsequence of, you know, of, 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 of the ends now, if Z is a, is, a, is, a, is a compact metric space, you have a subsequence that converges to the ultra limit. Okay, so this you see uh, very easily. So let me maybe note this down, because we'll use that later. So easy, if Z is compact metric space, then given such a sequence, there exists a subsequence Z and J that converges to um, the limit, the ultra limit. Okay, so this is so this is this is trivial, okay? Okay, so in some sense, this can be thought of, you know, choosing in a consistent way um, um, subsequences or limits for subsequences. Okay? So now we can define the distance or a pseudo pseudo metric, okay, um, in our x hat, which is just a bounded sequences, right? 
we can just um, um, take an ultra limit rather than a limit because limit in general doesn't exist. Okay. Um, so this is straightforward that this is a, a pseudometric. So it just might be that you know certain points. Of course, if you take two points that converge, right, or sequences that converge in distance, right, then this will get in general get get uh, they will have the same limit. So that you know um, this should be. Now we can just identify um, all the sequences that have this distance or pseudo distance zero, and this will be our metric space, okay, which is called the ultra limit. Okay. So the ultra limit, by definition, of such a sequence of metric spaces with base points uh, with respect to such a non-principal ultra filter, is just a triple. Okay, it's x hat when you mod out or uh, you know equivalence relations of sequences where you know two sequences are the same when they have the same ultra distance limits okay and then with them that becomes a distance and you also have a base point which is just uh, the um, the um, equivalence relation uh, equivalence class of of the pns So now let's maybe just give a few examples. So when X is a proper metric space, um, so that means every closed ball of finite radius is compact, okay, for example, Rn. And if you take the constant sequence, okay, so then you just take you know, bounded sequences, constant sequence with a constant base point, then it's not hard to show that uh, the, this ultra limit with respect to any non-principal ultra filter is isometric to the space itself. Okay. So for those who know what a gromov hausdorff um, limit is, um, I won't go uh, into that. Um, so if we have proper metric spaces, uh, a sequence of proper metric spaces and the sequence of, of base points, and if this sequence converges in the point that gromov hausdorff sends to a limit space, x infinity, p infinity, then any ultra limit is isometric to this limit space. Okay. So this is in some sense a generalization of, of the first example. Okay. Again, this is not, uh, is, is, not, is, not, is not very difficult. However, you have to be careful. Okay. So if I take now non-proper spaces, so say for example your X is a infinite dimensional Banach space, okay, or you know any for example infinite set with a discrete metric, okay, then if you take the constant sequence, then the ultra limit is in general not the space itself. Okay? So this is simply because you know in an infinite dimensional Banach space, you know, you have many Sequen or most sequences don't have a uh, convergent subsequence, right? Okay, so then you can't you can't actually expect anything. So so in general, um, or all you know every every time you have an infinite dimensional Banach space, the ultra limit of the or it's called the ultra product of you know the constant sequence, this is much much bigger space. Okay, so this is uh, yeah. So basically, it has to do with the second tool, right? So there because there you have. Compact, uh, you have a, a sequential. Um, uh, there you have you have uh, that it's a weak star compact, and then then you get that. Okay, so so it's it's a much much bigger space. Um, it's comparable to the second dual. Okay, so now let's go back to our um, problem of when we have special sequences of metric spaces. So we said that we want to rescale and pass to a um, limit. So now we just fix our space and we want to rescale the metric right? uh, with factors that go to zero. And we'll also now consider base points. Okay? So now here we know we can make sense of a uh, ultra limit. Okay? And when you have an ultra limit like that, it's called asymptotic cone. Okay. So, 
the way you should really think about this is that, so let's maybe look at the specific example. Let's, for example, just say Z in R. Okay. So say our base point is just always P n is equal to zero, right? Okay. So now you rescale your metric. So that means, you know, these points become closer and closer to each other. Okay. But, you know, for example, if you go at distance, say distance um, 100, okay, so you'll always have, again, points basically where um, that are distance to this guy here, more or less 100, right? Even after rescaling, it will just be basically the guy that is around 1 over Rn distance, okay, will become this, this guy here, okay? So then it's pretty straightforward to check that this guy here, um, any ultra, uh, any asymptotic cone, which usually I will just denote by, 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 by you know, Z, or sorry, that's uh, the space and W, uh, no, uh, omega, sorry, um, this will just be R, okay? Isometric to R, okay? Um, so maybe let me go one further. That's the notation that we will usually use. We will just uh, not make mention of the Rn's and the Pn's. Um, um, but you know they're always implicitly in the background. They will be, they, they will be there. Um, so in some sense, what you should think, how you should think of, of asymptotic cones is that you basically go further and further away from, from from the space, and you try, you know, you look at the space from further and further away, right? So if you do that, for example, in Z, if you go further and further away, you know, in some sense, an observer will see these points closer and closer and closer together, okay? And as you go to a limit, as you go in infinitely far away, you know, then basically that is your, what you see is the asymptotic cone. So in some sense, that's how you should think of asymptotic cone should be the space as seen from infinitely far away, okay? And so what are the base points? Well, and, you know, so basically, of course, certain parts of the, of the space can get lost, right? So if I'm very far in this space uh, over there, but my observation point is, is, is basically here, and my rescaling factor, you know, is not fast enough to zero, right? Basically, there's only one portion of the space that, that, that will be, uh, still be visible. And the points over here, they just go to infinity, okay? So, um, okay, one crucial observation or uh, a theorem that one can prove, that Gromov proved, is the following. So remember, a geodesic metric space is called Gromov hyperbolic if any triangle is thin. So triangles, they basically look like this, you know, basically here, the distance is always smaller than a certain delta uh, fixed, okay? So now if you go further and further away from the space and you look at um, bigger and bigger triangles, well, what will you see? Well, basically, you know, this distance here from far away becomes very, very small. So if you, you know, if you take a scaling factor Rn, you go Rn away, right? You basically, this becomes delta Rn, okay? So as you go further and further away, these guys here, they look more and more uh, like the same guy. So what you'll see infinitely from infinity, you'll basically see a tripod, okay? So anything that is bounded, okay? So the asymptotic cone of a bound metric space will just be one point, okay? So here, you know, that's, uh, um, yeah. So if X is Gromov hyperbolic, so if these are thin, then every asymptotic cone, so that means for any choice of Rn going to zero and Pn's and non-principal ultrafilters, um, you'll actually get a metric tree, which is a geodesic metric space where every geodesic triangle is zero thin, or in other words, it looks like a tripod. Okay. However, also the converse is true. Okay. So if every asymptotic cone 
of x is a metric tree, then all there exists a delta such that all these guys are delta thin. Okay. Actually, you don't even need for every non-principal ultra filter. You can fix one non-principal ultra filter, and if this is true, okay, for all choices of p n's and r n's, then you'll get that it's Gromov hyperbolic. Okay. So this is not immediately evident, right? So because what could happen is that you could you have to avoid the following thing. So you can have very big big bigger and bigger triangles, right? And somehow where where the distance here we said beforehand it should be bounded by a delta. Okay? But in principle it could just be bounded by um, an amount, so we have here a guy in here, it could be bounded by something that is just sublinear in the diameter of this guy, right? So then, you know, when you rescale, basically make this triangle, you know, uh, of always of size one, this will be sublinear, okay? So this distance will still go to zero, okay? However, you know, you don't have a uniform number delta, you just have a delta times Rn, right? So this is, this is the problem. So there, in this direction, you actually have to clearly prove something, okay? So that's, that's not 100% um, uh, clear. So, um, yeah, uh, because I don't have a lot of time, I think I'll just uh, skip this and um, we'll leave this uh, uh, as this. Um, okay. Um, so now, we have the two things that we need. We have this theory of currents where we have, you know, closure theorems and compactness theorems that we can use, uh, that where we have a chance to pass to limits, okay? And we have the notion of rescalings, okay? So now we'll formulate, we'll formulate the, um, uh, basically this persistence of quadratic filling functions to the limit, namely to asymptotic currents. Okay, so we'll be a little bit more general because, as I said at the beginning today, that, you know, this theorem that I stated, um, the filling area function in the metric space is really, you know, considers both local and global data. And we only, we want to make it independent of the local behavior of a metric space. Okay, so, so we will actually, um, um, we will actually do the following thing. Okay, so we'll have our metric space X in here. Okay. So in order to make it, in order to make it um, independent, our filling area function um, from local data. So that means, for example, if you have a hole here, right? I mean, you don't have fillings in general. Okay. So what we'll do, we'll actually take a bigger space. So this is our x. We'll work with bigger spaces. Why? Okay where that are nicer, okay? So we allow any metric space Y that is, contains X, okay? Which is at finite distance of uh, X, okay? So that means this is smaller than some big constant L. What do I mean by this? Just if I take all the, you know, every point in Y is at distance at most L, okay? So this uh, I'll sometimes call a thickening of the space. Um, so then, you know, here you suddenly have something in there. Um, okay, or I call it at uh, bounded uh, distance. Oops, sorry, that's the wrong uh, direction. Okay, so now we have these two metric spaces. We'll assume both are geodesic and Y is complete because we want to use uh, currents in there, right? So we assume it's complete. So now for a Lipschitz curve in X, we'll define the filling area now without a zero down there, that means, you know, it's not necessarily a disk. So this will be um, the infimal mass of a integral two current in Y whose boundary is exactly the curve, okay? So here actually I identify S1 basically with zero one with the endpoints identified. So the curve, you know, will just be a curve on zero one and it should be a closed curve. So that's the, the current. It's basically the push forward of the unit interval, which is just a curve, right? Okay, so now for a given curve, I have 
here a integral current that fills it. Okay, and I take the infimal guy. Okay. So now, um, one remark which I should make, so of course, so if you take just um, as your current, you take now push forward, so you take, remember beforehand for the filling area with a zero, this was just basically Lipschitz, um, Lipschitz maps from the disk, right? Okay. So now, of course, a Lipschitz map on the disk gives you a current just by pushing forward the indicator function on D, V of phi. Okay. So we could always take this guy here. Okay. So then, you know, the boundary is still this. And so now, you know, you think, okay, so now we have a lot more choices, right? Okay, so we have a lot more choices, so this guy here should actually be strictly smaller than the filling area, or should be, sorry, not strictly small, but it should, should be bounded by the filling area, okay? So this, however, is not necessarily true. It's only true up to a universal factor. So why, why is this? Why, why is this? So basic, the, the, the basic reason is that, so remember for the area of a map, for a Lipschitz map, we used a parameterized Hausdorff measure. Okay. So it was basically the integral of, you know, um, of a Jacobian in some sense, right? Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, you're right. Here, that's a mistake. There should be a uh, no, no. There should be sorry. That should be in X itself. Okay. This should be in X itself. And the other is in X zero. This is still in X, yes, but only using disks. That's the one that we defined before for area of fees, right? Filling, yeah, the supreme, yeah, the the, the infimal uh, area of of disks, right? Okay. So the reason why you don't have here one, okay, is basically that the area, the definition of area is different. So the mass of this guy here, okay, will not be, in general, the area of phi, even if phi is injective. Okay, if phi is not injective, right, you could have cancellation in a current. So if you do something like this, you go back like this as a, you know, this is just a slice should be something like this, you get cancellation, right, for, for current. So this will be just, as a current, this will be invisible, this will be zero, right? Um, um, so that's the first, you know, why you don't have necessarily this, right? But even if it's injective, it's not going to be the same, because if it's injective, right, we said that this is the two-dimensional Hausdorff measure um, of the image, okay? On the other hand, here, how did we define the mass, right? We basically defined the mass um, as taking um, the supremum, so here, as uh, basically taking the supremum all, all over all f pi's, where this is uh, one Lipschitz and this is bounded by one, right? So now if you, if you do this for this s here, so that gives you the integral of f phi, the determinant of, so this is um, the determinant of um, d, now we have pi and phi, right? Okay, so that actually gives you, if you take the supreme of that, that gives you a different kind of area, okay? So this, um, usually what this is called, is a, this, this area is called the Gromov mass star area, okay? And this is just comparable to the Hausdorff measure, you know, up to a certain factor. Okay. So just keep this in mind, but this will not play a big role uh, for us at all, I can, uh, actually. Okay, so um, that is this. And now we define the generalized homological filling area function, homological because we use, we use currents, okay, um, and generalized because we use basically curves in X and fillings in maybe a bigger space. Um, so, um, this is just defined exactly the way we defined it um, in, 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 in um, 
for, for disks, right, just by replacing now um, the um, filling area zero with the filling area in Y using integral currents. Okay? Otherwise, it's exactly um, the, the, same, the same thing. Okay, so we will also abbreviate um, FAX to mean FAXX. So if we stay in the same space, we want the filling in the same space, we will just um, 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 use this abbreviation, which is similar to the one we had before. Um, and clearly, again, this guy here is going to be comparable, or small or equal to a constant times the filling area zero. Okay. Now, maybe I should make a um, quick remark uh, concerning this. Uh, wait. Yes, we can, of course, also, instead of just considering curves, right, we should, uh, we should uh, could also consider uh, integral one currents. Okay, so that means, you know, not just one boundary curve, but we could use, for example, so many curves, or more generally just an integral one current without boundary, okay? So for this, we can also define the filling area, okay? Just exactly the same way, except that T need not be a curve, but it can be an integral one current, okay? So we can define then what is usually called, you know, a, a quadratic isoprometric inequality, or any kind of isoprometric inequality for integral currents, if now for every integral current um, we have integral one current, we have an integral two current whose boundary is T and whose mass is bounded by a constant times the mass squared of this form. Okay. So this is an... Uh, and what one can show is actually that filling area function the way we defined it is uh, being quadratic is um, equivalent to having a quadratic isoprometric inequality, okay? So, has a quadratic isoprometric inequality for integral currents is the same as having, having F A Y. So here we are both times in the same space Y, huh? Okay, so, um, so this is again the abbreviation F A Y Y, um, okay? So this is basically just uses the following fact that whenever I have an integral current one current without boundary, then I can write it as the infinite sum of closed curves, okay? So then there exists curves, CI, uh, they're all injective, such that Lipschitz curve, such that T is basically just the push forward of these, cur uh, of these curves, okay? And, you know, the mass basically is the same as the mass of the, of, of the thing, okay? And then you use um, also that, you know, R squared is convex, okay? So that actually also works whenever you have that this is basically bound a, a convex function, then you get an isoprometric inequality with the same convex function, okay? So R squared is just, is not, you could take R cubed or anything like that, you know, simply you need something that is convex because once, you know, you take the fillings of each of these curves, I do get SIs whose boundaries are basically the, the push forwards of the CIs. Then you want to take the sum of all these SIs, right? You take basically the mass of this is bounded by the sum of the masses. For each one of those, you have an isoprometric inequality like that. So you have to basically make sure that the, the things persist, okay? So that's, that's uh, yeah. So they're basically the same concept whether you take curves or integral currents. So no uh, worries about that. Okay, so now we have the proposition that we, uh, we, we have been aiming for. So now x, a geodesic space, okay? And y is a bigger space, which is at bounded distance, which is, just means that any point is at bounded distance from, for, from x, okay? So then if we have that the generalized uh, filling area function is at most quadratic on a large scale, right? then every asymptotic cone has an honest um, 
quadratic isoprometric inequality. Okay, so that means any curve can be filled. Um, can be filled. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we're gonna uh, we're gonna prove this. Okay. So yeah, I hope I have time. So the idea is. Not difficult. I mean, so basically, as I already said, what we're using is simply that whenever you have a curve in an asymptotic cone, you can approximate it in some sense by curves in our space, right? Bigger and bigger curves. Okay, you fill each of those. Okay, you can fill them by integral currents in there, and you know then pass to a you want to pass to a limit. Okay, so the only problem is the following, of course. Uh, so somehow, you have bigger and bigger things. You have maybe currents that look more and more like this. So somehow, you have to make sure that you can pass to a limit for these currents. Okay? So, so the problem is that they might become wilder and wilder and wilder. And then how do you do convergence? Right? So that's a, the big problem. The only thing that we've seen is that if S ends are all in a compact metric space, okay, if you have currents say in I2 or anything, in a compact metric space that have bounded uh, mass and bound the boundary mass, then you have a subsequence that converges. Okay? So, but if your fillings, say that is your curve Cn that approximates in some sense your final curve in x omega, okay? so, and you take Sn's here, okay? so we we'll have to push these guys into a compact metric space in order to be able to you know, take a limit. right? So, but if they, these guys become wilder and wilder, I mean, you, I don't know. I mean, you can't, you can't um, hope that you can actually put them into a, a common metric space, which is compact, right? So that is what we have to deal to with. But however, if we have a quadratic isometric inequality, then um, we have much nicer fillings, okay? So basically, if you take an area minimizer, if there exists an area minimizing filling here, right, then you can't have anything like this, okay? Because that is definitely not area minimizing. You basically could cut it here and fill something in which is much better, okay? So that's, um, yeah. So um, let me see, okay? So, um, yes, the direct consequence is, is, is the thing that I stated first. If you have such a thing, then you get uh, this for everything. Okay, so that's, that's just the direct consequence. Um, so now, uh, yes, preparation for the proof. Now we'll state a, 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 a proposition of Ambrosio Kirchheim, which says that if we have an isoprometric inequality, a quadratic one, then we actually get nicer fillings. Okay. So um, Suppose y is now a complete metric space, and suppose it has a quadratic isoprometric inequality for integral currents. Okay. So then for any integral cycle and for any epsilon, there exists a filling of T, which is as close to the optimal in area or in mass as you, as you want, plus which has the following um, growth lower growth of, 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 the, of the mass. So basically at every point, if I take an R ball where the R you know, is smaller so, such that you don't hit the boundary, what you have in here is at least quadratic in R. Okay. So for example, this it definitely excludes a thing like this, right? Because if you take an R ball here, so this is a, a, a thin tube, Right, which, whose area or mass is basically just r times the circumference, which is very extremely small. Okay, so this means you get actually things that um, have that. And you know, if there exists an area minimizer, then this is a relatively easy computation. Okay, so I'll, I'll maybe show that. Um, I'll maybe show that afterwards. Okay, so this and this you can make sense of, or this actually works in any dimension. Okay. So two-dimensional currents, that's nothing special. You can do that for higher dimensional, 
when you have, instead of a quadratic, you have the Euclidean equivalent um, of, of, of the quadratic isochromatic inequality. So Euclidean isochromatic inequality. Um, okay, so now I'd like to um, show you the proof using this lemma of this proposition, um, uh, of this proposition. Okay. So, um, so proof of proposition using theory of integral currents and using this lemma. So it's in two steps. So first of all, we would like to use the lemma. So we need a space where we can, where we have a, a quadratic isochromatic inequality. Okay. So our filling function, right? This just considers curves in X with fillings in Y. So maybe there's actually, you know, curves in Y that cannot be filled at all, right? So our space Y might be not good enough. However, you can always find a space which, so there exists Y prime geodesic and complete. with the following properties. Well, um, so first of all, y, this y here, is in y prime isometrically, okay? And y prime is at finite distance. Of y. And y prime has an honest quadratic isochromatic inequality for curves. Has quadratic isochromatic inequality for integral one current, sorry. Okay. So any curve or more generally any um, sum of curves can be uh, filled nicely. Okay. So you have to thicken up your space uh, correctly. So this is a bit of a, of a, of a technical thing uh, that you have to go through. However, this is not, it's not so difficult. Okay. For any curve, basically you have to glue in a disc and then you have to make sure that everything works out, but that's, that's not, not a big deal. Okay. So now, um, the second step. So now we take any asymptotic cone. So let X be just X. We take a scaling sequence. We take observation points and a non-principal ultrafilter, and we uh, take this asymptotic cone. And, um, and so let C be now a curve, a Lipschitz curve. Let's say from a closed Lipschitz curve into the asymptotic cone. Okay. So this is the following picture. So now we would like to approximate this. So I claim that the following is, is sufficient to do the following. Okay. So um, we choose a partition, a finite partition of the interval, um, say t m equals to one, a partition. Okay. Um, and so um, I claim that it's enough to show. Show that there exists a C prime Lipschitz with the following properties. Um, first of all, it coincides. It coincides with um, the points with these partition points. So that means C prime at T i is just C of ti and the length on the sub intervals of c prime this is smaller or equal to the length of the c's on these sub intervals okay and There exists. So now, what do we have? We have the following. Um, let's maybe make this a bit easier picture, like this. So we have a curve. Okay, that's my c uh, uh, c prime. That's my c, and I can fill a 
I can fill this, so there exists a two current in Y prime, whose boundary is just the C prime, the push forward. And the mass of S is bounded by, um, say, the isoprometric constant, which I say is called C, times the, um, the, um, the length of my original curve squared. So that means we have here, we have a current S. And so why is this, uh, why is this um, uh, sufficient? Well, we can just go, you know, basically one step at a time. We first, for example, we divide into, um, say, oh, maybe I should have one more point. Okay, let's take one more point. Okay. Okay. So now I do the same thing. So I make sure that all the lengths here are the same length. So the length divided by five, for example. Okay. So now I continue the same thing. So this guy here, what length does it has? It has smaller or equal to two times the length divided by five. Right? So if I take this curve. Okay. So now I can divide this again by five. One, two, three, four, five. And I can just take the same procedure if such a thing exists, right? I can take the same thing and I can divide, I get an S, another S, right? So I can do that with everyone and then I go smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? So then if you add up everything, everything works, okay? Because basically in the, in the kth step, right, you have, um, five to the k, if you divide it by five, five to the k uh, curves of, you know, two to the k or five to the k uh, times, times the length, okay? But you, since you can um, fill each one quadratically, you get this squared, which is two to the two uh, k over five to the two k times five to the two k, still gives you four to the k over five to the k, and, you know, that is uh, in the, uh, a geometric series, right? Okay, so, um, so this is actually enough. And so now um, we can do our approximation um, the way um, we announced. So now we just denote xi to be the c of ti. Okay, so that we just take now, we have just have to, to get our c prime, right? So now these are our points. They're in the asymptotic cone. So these you can write as X and I's as equivalent um, classes of, of sequences, right? So now um, we can go to the original space and we can take, um, there exists Lipschitz, there exists curves, now to x with this rescaled metric with c n t i is x n i and such that c n on t i t i plus one this is a geodesic so now you have these points in your original space, say X, R, N, D, and you just take two decics. Okay, so now um, I have only like two, three minutes. So um, now clearly, because these are bounded sequences, right? So, and we have only finitely uniform number of points um, in our partition, um, so, uh, we get actually that the CNs, as curves in here, are uniformly Lipschitz. Okay. So now, since we have a quadratic isoprometric inequality in Y prime, um, this good lemma here that tells us that we have good fillings for these curves. Okay. So we can take fillings like this, so, 
So, by the lemma, there exists Sn in an integral current in this space Y prime. Now, let me rescale the metric because we have a quadratic isochromatic inequality that doesn't change. You know, it still has a quadrat the same quadratic isochromatic inequality such that the boundary is exactly this curve Cn, the push forward, and such that that we have, you know, two and three in the lemma. In lemma. Okay. So now I can define metric spaces or subsets of my metric space. Y prime simply as, um, as my curve union the support of Sn with this rescaled metric. Okay. So a picture is the following. Okay, so that could be my CN. It might backtrack, so it might actually, you know, cancel something out. So, and here we have our SN. Okay. So now the claim, or it follows directly from, you know, the, the third condition there. Okay. That now we have a sequence of metric spaces that this is uniformly compact. Okay. In the following sense. So for every epsilon, there exists an n which only depends on epsilon and not on, on the little n, such that you can cover a n by a number at most n of epsilon balls. Okay? And at the same time, the supremum, the diameters are bounded of the ANs bounded by a fixed constant lambda. Okay. So let me just quickly say why this is, and then actually I, uh, um, I guess I have to stop um, a bit short. I'll just basically explain then uh, what one can do. Um, so why is this the case? Well, where any, you take any point in the support of Sn, right? So if I, and that is at distance, bigger or equal to, say, epsilon fourth, okay? So now if I take the epsilon fourth ball, the open one, it has a certain amount of area, certain amount of mass, okay? So now you just pick more and more of these points that are all at distance at least epsilon half, right? So how many points can you find like this? Well, each one has this amount of mass, so, you know, because our, um, so you can get at most the mass of Sn, you know, and divided by this number where r is equal to epsilon fourth, okay? But since this guy here is bounded by the length of, um, by the length of the curve, right, uh, by Cn, Cn has uniformly uh, bounded length, you know, this is a, a, bounded, a bounded number, okay? Uniformly bounded number. So this you get, okay? So now, um, Yeah, okay, I think I have to stop, sorry. Um, that's stupid now. Um, can, I, can you give me five minutes? Sorry about that, just give me five minutes and I'll explain quickly the ideas and then um, um, maybe I'll just put the things on, on, on the slides and put them on the, on the web so you can actually, yeah. Okay, so we get this uniform compactness and now Gromov's compactness theorem, which I'll just take as a black box, box which says exactly what I'm stating now, Gromov's compactness theorem, says that there exists a compact metric space whenever you have a sequence of uni a uniformly compact sequence of metric spaces, there exists a compact metric space and there exists isometric embeddings of your spaces, of all of your spaces in this compact C isometric embeddings, okay? So now, you, that means you can put them all into, uh, into one metric space, one big metric space Z, 
okay, which is still compact, okay. So now, of course, you can push forward your SNs. These now are integral two currents, and they all have, you know, they're basically it's a bounded sequence because the masses, right, they are um, uniformly bounded, and the, the 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 boundary curves are just CN, which are uniformly bounded. So you can, by the closure and compactness theorem, you can get a subsequence at least that goes to an integral two current in your z. Okay. So this is the closure and compactness, which we stated. Okay. So these converge up to a subsequence, and the same thing by our Celas Coli. You can assume that your curves, the push forwards of your curves, right, the curves, they are in A n now, that they converge uniformly to a Lipschitz curve. Okay. So now the only thing that you have to do, you have to push these forward to your asymptotic cone. Okay. So in principle, you know, these curves here, the, the C n's, you know, the, uh, they approximate in some sense your original curve, or at least, you know, at a finite number of points, they approximate. So you want to push that forward, and you want to push the limit forward as well. Okay. The only problem that you have now is, of course, that if, you know, you're choosing here a subsequence, but if your non-principal ultrafilter chose a different subsequence in some sense, right? So this guy here, this subsequence could actually be a negligible subsequence. Okay, so your omega of these nj's, they could be, yeah. So there you have to be a little bit careful, okay, um, but this you can do. I mean, you, there's a certain subset that you can, so you, the subset A in Z, which is basically all the ultra limits of, um, say, psi n a n's, where the A n's are in A n, okay? So these, this set, subset of ultra limits, okay, this you can push forward. That's no problem, okay? And now you find a subsequence, because you're in a compact metric space, you find a subsequence, you know, such that basically the psi n j's, A n j's, okay, they converge in the Hausdorff sense to a subs subset of the A, Okay, and the currents, then you just take a subsequence again. Okay, as soon as you lie in this guy in here, then nothing can happen. Okay, so I'm sorry this was a bit quick and a bit uh, uh, messy, but um, yeah. So maybe I'll I'll put the uh, put the um, the idea or the, the details in the in the uh, in the notes. Um, are there any questions? Sorry for going over time so much. Um, <laughs>